Well, as you open up your Bibles to John chapter 7, my heart is saddened a little bit to leave John chapter 6. That was such a powerful chapter. We learned so much through those many messages we went through through that chapter. Uh, please remember, that was the feeding of the fire. Jesus walking on the water. Uh, Jesus talking about him being the bread of life. Uh, Jesus bringing us in elevation of ideas of eating his flesh and drinking his blood. And then the false disciples left. They left him and even looked at the 12 and said, will you leave me also? And just the humanity in Jesus as he said those words, wondering if his own 12 would leave him. But they stuck with him as the others departed. But he even said, one of you is a devil. So man, you got one guy out of 12 who's not even a helper. He's a hindrance to the ministry, but he, Jesus now moves into a time of ministering to the 12. So I titled our study tonight, Destroy, Deride, and Debate. And this is what Jesus is going to move into uh, as he goes to the Feast of Booths up in Jerusalem. So let me read, uh, starting in verse 1 of John chapter 7. And, uh, you know, I try to make it easy on you guys on Sundays by putting up the scriptures for you. Uh, but someday I'm not going to do that to make you make sure you bring your Bibles and your devices. Um, but let me read. It says, after these things, Jesus walked in Galilee, for he did not want to walk in Judea because the Jews sought to kill him. Now, the Jews feast of tabernacles was at hand. His brothers therefore said to him, depart from here and go up into Judea, that your disciples also may see the works that you are doing. For no one does anything in secret, while he himself seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. For even his brothers did not believe in him. So Heavenly Father, we come before you tonight so desirous to hear from your spirit, to have your word minister to your people through the power of the Holy Spirit. So I pray that you would remove me from the picture and that you would speak to your saints directly. I don't want to get in the way of what you want to speak to each one of their hearts. So please do this in Jesus' name. So let's look and see what happens directly after John chapter 6. And as you just read kind of directly through the scriptures, sometimes you miss out on the timeline of what happens. So it says, after these things. And sometimes you can think, oh, okay, like three days after the previous thing that we talked about where the false disciples left Jesus. But actually, we're talking about a longer period of time. It says, after these things, Jesus walked in Galilee. For he did not want to walk in Judea because the Jews sought to kill him. Now the, the Jews' feast of tabernacles was at hand. So when you see a feast come up in the scriptures, that gives you a notification of time. So remember when we started John chapter 6, it said that it was about the time of, Pente of, um, of Passover, right? That it was the time of Passover, which was in the springtime. Now, the Feast of Booths, or Tabernacles, or you could call it the Feast of Tents. Um, even you might call it the Feast of Lean-Tos. That's what I like to call it. But that idea that they set up these tents to acknowledge what had happened as they traveled through the wilderness with God during those 40 years of wilderness wanderings. And it tell us, tells us in John 5, 18, therefore the Jews sought all the more to kill him because he did not only, he not only broke the Sabbath, but he also said that God was his father, making himself equal with God. So I went all the way back in chapter five. So you would realize that almost for a year's period of time, the Jews have sought to kill Jesus and that the Feast of Tabernacles acknowledges that timeline, and they have been festering in Judea. We went to chapter 6, Jesus talking about him being the bread of life and eating his flesh and drinking his blood. Those reports were going back to Judea. 
and is just causing the Pharisees and the leaders of the religious organization to be fired up and wanting him dead. And Jesus was very aware of that. Now, the Feast of Tabernacles was very interesting in regards to celebrating God's abundant provision during their time in the wilderness. Remember what he provided for them? Six days a week, he provided manna to feed over three million people. And what an amazing feat to feed all these people on a daily basis. What else happened? They had the best pair of sandals that anyone could ever have. You think you've got a pair of shoes that lasted a long time. Well, maybe you do have a 40-year-old pair of sandals. I don't know. But that's what they had, a pair of sandals that never wore out. No matter how long they walked through that desert wilderness, they never, never wore out. It also says their ankles never swelled. Well, how would you like to never roll an ankle or have edema on your legs? No neuropathy for these guys. They marched around the wilderness for 40 years without their ankles swelling. And remember that Jesus followed them through the wilderness. He was the rock that gave them water when they needed it. You know what was there? It was a miraculous sign every day and every night. A pillar, a cloud by day to keep them cool. Could have used that today. And a pillar of fire by night to show them the way. 40 years of miraculous signs. And so they're going to Jerusalem to celebrate this event. But Jesus knows they're waiting for him. They're waiting to jump on him. They want to kill him. We also know that the Feast of Tabernacles will be one that we'll celebrate in the millennial reign of Christ. It tells us that in Zechariah 14. If you don't go up and celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles with the Lord, then it won't rain on your land for that whole time and in that area if you don't go. So we can look forward to celebrating this with Jesus in our future. Well, we'll now take a look at those who you would think would be his greatest supporters, his own family. I mean, maybe you've had trouble in your own life, and man, your family's always been with you. That blood's thicker than water. Didn't quite work out this way with Jesus. Let me read this for us out of John 7, 3 through 5. It says, his brothers therefore said to him, depart from here. And go into Judea, that your disciples also may see the works that you are doing. For no one does anything in secret, while he himself seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. For even his brothers did not believe in him. You know, this was surprising reading through this for the first time for me. Being a good Catholic boy, what do you mean Jesus has brothers? Jesus has sisters? Well, what happened to the perpetual virginity of Mary? Well, the Bible doesn't teach that. The Roman Catholic tradition teaches that, but the Bible doesn't. That's not what Joseph signed up for to be a husband. He was very thankful to have Jesus and to be the, the overseer of Jesus as he grew up, but he married a woman to perpetuate his family line, and he did that very thing. So Jesus had four brothers and at least two sisters. You can read that in Matthew 13. How many people here know what Jesus is, what the names of Jesus' brothers were? Okay, I know. Okay, I got James, right? John. Jude. Jude. Simon. That's the tough one. Yeah. Okay, who's the last one? Yeah, Joseph or Joseph. Yeah, you have a junior in there. And so, of course, we know James because he wrote a letter that we have in our New Testament. Jude, we also have a letter in the New Testament. Simon. Uh, through biblical, uh, his, historical biblical accounts, when James died, there was a void of leadership, and Simon stepped in to, do, to take that spot. Uh, so we know that Simon, through, by, through tradition, biblical tradition, um, uh, outside of the biblical tradition, we know that he stepped into that position. But we see here that even though Jesus was the perfect brother, he exemplified the perfect family relationship. They did not believe in him till his death and his resurrection. And I just want that to be an encouragement to you. You know, this is one of my hobby horses about ministering to your families. Right around the corner is Thanksgiving and Christmas. And you know what? If your family hasn't supported you, 
know that Jesus stands along with you in that. They haven't believed in you or your faith or bought into your commitment to Jesus. You know, here, take another chance to reach out to them because we don't know if we have another Thanksgiving with our families again. I know this, fam- this Thanksgiving, I don't have my mom this Thanksgiving. My last Thanksgiving with her was last year. But I just want to encourage you, take advantage and go in a different direction in regards, maybe you didn't do it perfectly. Would you ask that family member or those people that you're close to, maybe it's for forgiveness that you didn't do it right. Maybe you would humble yourself and said, you know, I messed up when you were growing up. Or I messed up when we had that interaction years ago. That you might reach out and try to build that bridge again. Or maybe you did play it out perfectly right. Things the way that you should. Continue to do that. Continue to minister to your family. They need to know who Jesus is. But we see Jesus here, the perfect brother. I mean, what was it like? I mean, we kind of think that maybe it would be fun to grow up with Jesus in the house with you. But it's like you can never frame him for anything. You know, he's always on the right side of the argument. He was always like mom's favorite. But I bet he always stepped out and helped however he could. Uh, He probably never like put anyone down and gave him a Charlie horse. He probably helped everyone in the family as much as he possibly could. And he stuck next to his mom and his dad as long as his dad lived and supported them. But yet, even the perfect example was not enough to bring these brothers into relationship with him and believing of who he was. And so they're saying, hey, go up to Jerusalem, make yourself known. Kind of a way to think of this is, you know, you got to leave Kettleman City and go to Los Angeles if you really want to be known. You got to get out of Taft and you got to go to San Francisco if you really want to make some disciples hear about who you are and for you to become famous. You can't just hang out in this podunk town in Galilee and make something happen. But they're doing it not because they believe, but because they're antagonistic to his mission. So now we're going to see what Jesus' commentary is in regard to timing. It says, Then Jesus said to them, My time has not yet come, but your time is always ready. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me, because I testify of it that its works are evil. You go up to this feast. I am not yet going up to this feast, for my time has not yet fully come. When he had said these things to him, he remained in Galilee. So here he first talks about the timing and what the world is like at this time. It says the world cannot hate you because they're part of the world system, but it hates me because I testify of it that its works are evil. And is is that Jesus' testimony today? Could you freely say that about our world today, that its works are evil? I hope that you can. I hope you would agree with Jesus. Not much has changed over the last 2,000 years. We continue to see the world fall into corruption. And it casts out those who would want to proclaim Jesus and to bring morality and godliness into a culture. This is still an evil culture that we live in. And Jesus is calling them out and the world out. And his testimony is still true today. But we need to remember that Jesus was working on a divine timeline. Jesus said to them that my time has not yet come. Remember the first time that we heard that? We heard that in John at the wedding at Cana. Remember how he said Jesus did to us. Is with me in regards of them being out of wine for this wedding. So Jesus brings us up multiple times. We'll see it later in this chapter. It says, therefore, they sought to take him, but no one laid a hand on him because his hour had not yet come. He is on a divine timeline. Even when he was born, it's a divine timeline. I love what it says in Galatians 4, 4 and 5. It says, but when the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth his son, 
born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who are under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. So you have a Christmas verse in the book of Galatians. He was born in a perfect timing, and his days and his hours are perfectly timed out for him to do the work of the Lord. We'll see in John 8, it says these words spoke, he, Jesus spoke in the treasury as he taught in the temple, and no one laid hands on him for his hour had not yet come. He has to fulfill a certain time and a group of ministry activities to fulfill succinctly God's will for his life that all prophecy may be accomplished. And then we see in John 17, in Christ's high priestly prayer, it says, Jesus spoke these words, lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son, that your son also may glorify you. So we come to the end of the story when he's putting his face and his eyes destined for the cross knowing that he's going to be crucified for our sins and to die and rise again. He has a timeline in mind, and his brothers are trying to motivate him outside of that timeline. But Jesus needs to be succinct in what he does. Well, Jesus' brothers are going to just go with the flow, the way of the world. In verses 6b and 7, it says, But your time is always ready. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify that its works are evil. And just that idea, are you going to be that yellow arrow? Are you going to be the ones that go against the flow? That's what we're called to do, to be salt and light in this world. Not to go the way of the world, but to go in the opposite direction. And what comes with that is friction is difficulty. Those who desire to live Christly, those who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. But we keep on going. We serve the Lord, even if our family is against us. So Jesus is not pressured by his brothers, but stays in Galilee. And I think that's a much better picture for him than people in outposts ready to take him down along the road to Jerusalem. It says, you go up to the feast. I am not yet going up to the feast, for my time has not yet fully come. When he had said these things to them, he remained in Galilee. And it doesn't seem that he remains that long, maybe just a couple of days, but he will not be compelled by anybody but the Lord. He gets his directive from the Lord. And that's just my encouragement for you, is are you consulting with the Lord on a daily, hourly basis, of what do you have for me, Lord? And we, you know, we have certain schedules that we need to keep, but to be, in a sense, audible to the voice of the Lord when he wants to change it up on you. When he does say, hey, go left instead of right today. Take the long way home instead of the short way. That you would have your ears open to his call if he would change your schedule in any way. Well, when the perfect time had come, Jesus made his way up to the feast. In verses 10 through 13, it says this, But when his brothers had gone up, then he also went up to the feast, not openly, but as it were, in secret. Then the Jews sought him at the feast and said, Where is he? And there was much complaining among the people concerning him. Some said, He is good. Others said, No, on the contrary. He deceives the people. However, no one spoke openly of him for fear of the Jews. So the brothers depart. They make their way up to Jerusalem. And you can pretty much remember through your scripture knowledge that any good, faithful, ceremonial Jew would divert around Samaria. Remember, the Jews would not go through Samaria when they went up to Jerusalem. They didn't want to defile themselves uh, with the Samaritans. But remember what Jesus did earlier, the woman who he saved at the well. And that whole area was now very aware of him. So Jesus could kind of take a shortcut to avoid those who might try to try to kill him on the road. He could go through Samaria. He wasn't worried about any unclean people there. He was able to pass through that area and slip into J Jerusalem basically unnoticed. So he didn't do it with a huge entourage. Most likely it was just his 12 
apostles with him, and he enters into the city pretty much unnoticed, but there's a buzz about him. The, the, all Jewish men had to go to Jerusalem three times a year for the Feast of Weeks, the Feast of First Fruits, and the Feast of Booths or Tabernacles. So they knew, being an observant Jew, that he would show up. So they're commenting, hey, has anyone seen him yet? Hey, what's up with him? Some people said he was good. But I want you to know that that's not good enough. That's not a comment that saves. There's many out there today in our world that say, says Jesus was good, that he was a good man, that he was a prophet. That is not enough to save. You've got to know him as Lord and Savior. God in human flesh dwelling among us, dying and rising from the dead. So good isn't enough. I was even kind of surprised last week how someone claimed that Jesus, if he walked today, that he would be woke. And I thought that was so interesting that you would post that on your Instagram. Jesus is far from a woke character. No, he is the Lord. He is the one that says this world is evil and its works are evil. Jesus would never lower himself. He has the compassion for every individual. He loves each one. But behaviors matter to Jesus. We also see here that some spoke about him, but not openly. They kind of gossiped about him, but they were afraid of the religious Jews, those who oversaw uh, the temple and the synagogues that if they spoke about him openly, something good, that they might be cast out of the religious ceremonies and they wouldn't have to be able to have fellowship with others within the community. So they were just murmuring, murmuring between themselves. And I hope we're not like that. I hope it's, this is not the only place that we talk about Jesus is inside these walls with those who are on our side, but that we're vocal with those who are outside in the world. Now, we wouldn't be will willing to be uh, ostracized. We wouldn't be fearful of being ostracized from others because Jesus is our Lord and our Savior. Well, Jesus doesn't stay hidden for long. He makes his way into the temple courts. It says, now, about the middle of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and taught. And the Jews marveled, saying, how does this man know letters, having never studied? So Jesus didn't hide out with his apostles for long. He, he sets up his little soapbox there somewhere near the temple. And they have these big courts around the temple building directly. And this is what different rabbis would do. They would go into one of these courts, the courts of the Gentiles, or somewhere where they have a big crowd, and they would begin to speak the truth of God's word. And that they would share what they've learned about the Bible, the Old Testament, and they would often quote other rabbis. And the reason they did that is to give them validation in what they were saying, and then also to acknowledge to the crowd that they're staying within the traditions. So that's one of our pastoral tricks that we do here on Sunday. It's not really a trick, is that we'll bring up quotes from Charles Spurgeon, uh, from other dedicated commentators on the faith. So one you'll know, okay, this pastor is staying in the banks of faith within the traditions, and he's also acknowledging good spiritual men. So you believe and know that we're staying on track. So it's not a trick as much. We want, to, want you to know that we are in agreement with these men of the faith, these that have held the tradition. They are amazed that Jesus is not quoting any rabbis that Jesus isn't saying anything that someone else had said previously. He has brand new, seems to them, sayings that he's speaking, and he's speaking in his own authority. You can even see a picture of this in the book of Acts through Paul. So Paul shared this in Jerusalem. It says, I am indeed a Jew, born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but brought up in the city of the feet of, at this city at the feet of Gamaliel, taught according to the strictness of our father's law and was zealous towards God as you all are today. So Paul had this very same tradition. He went to the correct seminary. He sat at the feet of Gamaliel. He learned the word of God in the traditions of the Jews from Gamaliel. 
And Jesus, he did not go to their seminaries. Jesus did not grow up under the feet of Gamaliel or any other rabbi. No, Jesus sat at the feet of his father. Well, we can also demonstrate that we, what we have knowing God, gives us the same authority to speak in any situation. I like what it says in Acts chapter 4, verse 13 about Peter and John. It says, now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled and they realized that they had been with Jesus. And I want you to feel encouraged by the Lord that since Jesus dwells in you and you read your Bible, that you are with Jesus. But actually, these who are coming against Peter and John, they're completely wrong. They, these two men weren't all, all, just with Jesus. They are currently with Jesus. And you are currently with Jesus too. As you walk in the Spirit, you take in His Word, you worship Him, you can go out in boldness. You don't have to have seminary training. You don't have to sit at the feet of some pastor. It helps. We all work together to encourage one another, but you can go in boldness and authority because Jesus lives in you and you put God's Word into your heart and mind every day. Well, let's return back to the Gospel of John and hear Jesus talk about where he got his wisdom and his authority. So Jesus answered them and said, My doctrine is not mine, but his who sent me. If anyone wills to do his will, he shall know concerning the doctrine, whether it is from God or whether I speak on my own authority. He who speaks from himself seeks his own glory, but he who seeks the glory of the one who sent him is true, and no unrighteousness is in him. So Jesus' doctrine came from the Father. He was just merely a conduit of what God was speaking. God sent him, and he spoke exactly what God the Father gave him. And if anyone wants to do the will of the Father, they will have this same recognition that the Word of God is being preached to them, that they're learning the Word of God. And I hope that's what you get here on Sundays, that we're not doing this for our own glory, but it's for the edification of the body. That's why I stick so closely to the Scriptures because I want to make sure you're hearing the word of God and not my word, that you know that God loves you and that he died for you and that he gave you his word to bring you encouragement every single day. I want to reinforce that every time we get up here and that we always want to point to the Lord in heaven, not to ourselves. When you know God's word, you want to seek God's glory with it and not your own. You want to lift up the Lord that he might be praised. Well, that brings us into Jesus shifting gears and bringing Moses into the conversation. Verse 19 through 21, it says, Did not Moses give you the law? Yet none of you the law. Why do you seek to kill me? The people answered and said, You have a demon. Who is seeking to kill you? Jesus answered and said to them, I did one work, and you all marvel. So Jesus says, if you won't receive the authority from heaven, I'm going to bring up this man that you seem to give great preeminence to, Moses. And Moses was venerated in a great way in the Jewish faith. But look at what he says about the law that Moses presented to the Jews. It says, yet, yet none of you keeps the law. What a tremendous condemnation of the religious groups of that time, that no one keeps the law. There were 613 laws in the Pentateuch. Man, that is a lot of laws to keep. And no one was doing it perfectly. No one do, was doing it correctly. It wasn't meant to be done correctly. It was to show you your need for salvation in another way. It was supposed to point you towards the Messiah. So Jesus brings up the law, and none of them keep it. And it's the same today. You go up San Antonio Creek Road, and you go by the synagogue up there. I'm sorry, no one's keeping the law up there. 
They can't sacrifice up there. There's no lambs being slaughtered on the Passover. There's no animals being sacrificed on the Day of Atonement. They cannot keep the law. They can't keep the law because Jesus is the only one who can fulfill the law and be the substitution. Well, then Jesus comes into knowing their hearts. He knows that they want to kill him. And it's interesting that the default position at this time, when you say someone wants to kill you, you're paranoid. Someone wants to kill you is that you have a demon. Most of the time we say that person's schizophrenic or bipolar or they have some sort of mental disorder. But in Jesus' day, it was demon possession that somehow a demon has attached itself to you and you're not thinking properly. But what's interesting is these will be the same people in just a short period of time that will be yelling, crucify him, crucify him. And this is in the heart of all men who don't know Jesus as Lord. They want him dead. They don't want him to stand in the way of what they want and their sinful behaviors. So they were seeking to kill him for about a year's period of time ever since he did one work and they marveled. Remember that? The healing of the man at the pool of Bethesda. And it wasn't, wasn't so much that he healed the man, but what day did he heal him on? On the Sabbath day, right? So you can heal people on Tuesdays. You can heal them on Thursdays, but don't heal them on the Sabbath. That makes us angry. Don't do that. Well, now Jesus is going to pivot and look at their own law and the way that they live out their lives in regards to circumcision. Very strange pivot here, but Jesus knows what he's doing. So verse 22, it says, Moses therefore gave you circumcision, not that it is from Moses, but from the fathers. And you circumcise a man on the Sabbath. If a man receives circumcision on the Sabbath, so the law of Moses should not be broken, are you angry with me because I made a man completely well on the Sabbath? So here, showing them how there's a counterproductive practical work that gets done on the Sabbath day. So if you were born eight days away from the Sabbath, you needed to be circumcised on the Sabbath because vitamin K is the most present in a baby's life on the eighth day. And so that's why they would uh, bring uh, circumcision to happen on that day. So the clotting process within the body would be present. And this would be a very... Uh, good and healthy circumcision without complications. And so they would do this work on a Sabbath day because it was necessary for the health. A very small do. So how can you guys, there's a conflict in your own religious practice and the way it's played out in real life. Why do you have this own conflict, but come after me when I make a man whole? When he's been burdened, for all these years, and I make them healthy and well, just because I do a good thing on the Sabbath, will you give me a hard time for that? You do this small work, and I do this immense work, and you say that I'm breaking the tradition, the law. There is no law in the Old Testament about healing people on the Sabbath. They just added to the law, and that's what religious people do. And we have to be leery of that ourselves. If we're adding to God's law in the way that we interact with the world or somehow put a buffer of religious behavior before people can come to the faith. No, you can come just as you are to Jesus. The most horrible, horrible sinner. And you can come to him and he will transform you and he will begin to live righteousness out through you. But if we bring, up, bring before people religious wranglings that hinder them from coming to the Lord, then we become like the Jews of this day. Well, let's finish up with our last verse, 724. Do not judge according to appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. And what a great word to encapsulate our day is that we should not judge a book by its cover. We should not look at the outside form of man, the color of their skin, the way that they were born in regards of genetics. 
the societal places that Jesus has allowed people to be born into. We need to be those who listen to people. People want to be heard these days. They don't want to be judged in a, a, a snap shot of their lives or a quick picture. I'm so convicted about this and just my, my self-righteousness that somehow I'll come to snap judgments about what, what people are and who they are and what they're about. We need to do what Jesus is commanded of us here, is not to judge according to appearance, but to judge with righteous judgment. So just that idea we get to know people, we get to hear their story. We don't know what people have been through, what trials, what tribulations, what trauma people have been through, but we'll just slap a label on them and we'll just move on. No, we need to learn in our day and age to take time to hear people's stories, to be listening. It's amazing how many books there are on speaking, on preaching. Pastors always get books on how to speak better and how to present information in a more practical, uh, better way to be heard. Uh, but there's not a lot of books on hearing. You don't see many on how to take the extra effort to listen and be attentive. There's a few of them out there, but not many. And that's what we need to do in our day and age. But also, it comes down to us looking at our surroundings and what's going on in our lives and what could be buried under the scenes. That we need to evaluate people's behaviors. We need to be able to judge in regards to saying this behavior is not correct. God condemns this type of behavior. God says this is right and this is wrong. And I will always agree with Jesus and what he says is right and wrong. So as we conclude tonight, just some things for you to take home with you. One is be on God's divine timeline. Keep your ears open to his leading. Don't get so stuck in a rut in kind of your normal habits of the day that Jesus can't call down to you and say, hey, would you go talk to this person or would you take the long way home? He might have you bump into some, somebody, or he might have you see some scene or some situation you could minister to or you could be praying for. The second is if your family is not in alignment with your faith, would you give them a chance once again? Would you ask Jesus to show you how to minister to your family this year? Maybe you do have to humble yourself and ask for forgiveness and try to start over again and minister to their hearts. Maybe you have done it perfectly, but they still won't believe. Well, you tell them what you're about. Maybe you can even go as far as, hey, at church, I ate Jesus' flesh and drank his blood. What a great Thanksgiving conversation that'll start, huh? Mm -hmm. And tell them about what you learned in John chapter 6. And then also know, don't be overly religious. And I'm talking to myself. Watch out when we're overly religious. And we, hen we hinder people's ability to get to the throne of God. No, all are welcome to come to Jesus. All notorious sinners are welcome to come. And we don't want to hinder anyone from doing that. So I just want to encourage you in those things tonight. Continue to read in John chapter 7. It's going to get really good. So Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your word. I pray that you would use it to inspire us, that it wouldn't be head knowledge. Lord, we know that knowledge puffs up, but love edifies. My desire is this is a loving message, an encouraging message to build up my brothers and sisters so that we could help one another and that we could be lights to the world. So please do this work in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.